Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Sorry for the, let's see, wait for it to come up. All right. Sorry for the terrible pun in the title, but I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> so, on our path to WASI 1.0, we started with WASI Preview 1, <clears throat> which contains a monolithic subset of POSIX based on Cloud ABI. And then we did a whole bunch of work to release WASI Preview 2 this January. And uh, in the spirit of Semver, we've taken to calling that WASI 0.2. And it contains two independent worlds, a CLI command world, which you can think of as Preview 1 plus sockets, and an HTTP proxy world. 0.2 also contains the component model, which defines for us a unit of code that we call the components and an IDL called WIT. And we define these worlds in terms of the component model. So what is a component? Well, for uh, a full, longer answer, uh, I gave a talk at WASMCon last year called What is a Component and Why? And you can find that on YouTube. So just to give a, a one-side summary of it, a component is an emerging, standard, portable, lightweight, finely sandboxed, cross-language, compositional module being developed in the W3C, uh, W3C uh, WebAssembly community group, layered over core WebAssembly 1.0, kind of like how TCP is layered over IP. We want components to be portable, running the same component binary on multiple WASM runtimes. So that means filling in the gaps left by not always having a native JS engine. We want components to be lightweight, just like Core Web Assembly, which means super fast cold starts and having a small runtime. We want components to be finely sandboxed so that they encapsulate their own uh, core memory and uh, table states, preventing access from other component instances which we usually refer to by saying that components are shared nothing. And we want components to be cross-language, so we compile them from different languages and have them interoperate. And then we, we want to be able to compose components, and that to produce a component, so we can compose them again, and on and on. And lastly, components are modules, meaning that their public interface is defined in terms of the familiar concepts of imports and exports. So that's what's in WASI 0.2. What's next? Well, there's two parallel tracks of work we want to undergo. The first is a sequence of minor releases extending 0.2. The idea here is to have more of a train model with regular releases, say like quarterly, where we're only making backwards compatible additions, say like adding a time zone interface to the WASI Clocks proposal, or defining whole new worlds like in the WASI Cloud Core proposal. And then in parallel to that, we want to do more of a major release for called uh, WASI 0.3, which previously I called WASI Preview 3. And uh, we want this as soon as possible, of course, but you know, likely this is going to take more than a year. And the, uh, the big feature here is adding native async in the component model, and then rebasing our 0.2 interfaces to take advantage of these features. So just to see what this might look like, let's uh, zoom in and, and talk about WASI HTTP. So first, let me start with a simple, very composable, but ultimately fatally flawed design, which I'm going to call simple HTTP. So in simple HTTP, we define our proxy world to import and export a handler interface. And the handler interface contains a single function that you can pass a request and get back a response or an error. And so when proxy world imports the handler interface, it's importing a function that you can call to make an outgoing request. And when the proxy world exports a handler, that component is exporting a function that's called by the outside world so the component can receive an incoming request. And the request is a resource type that could be passed a body as a list of bytes and return its body as a list of bytes, and similarly for response. And we can define and implement this today in 0.2. Say I could write a component that targets this world in JavaScript. I am using a JavaScript import to import the handle function and the response constructor. And then I could export a handle function that takes a request and constructs and returns a response. So I could implement this today in JavaScript, or Rust, or Python, or C, and an increasing number of languages that are adding 0.2 bindings. So what makes this simple HTTP proxy world composable? It's that it's importing and exporting the same interface. What that means is if I have a proxy component, say, that implements rate limiting, and another proxy component that does call tracing, I can just simply link them together because it's like the same interface on both sides. I can keep going, linking in a component that, say, caches HTTP gets or does authentication. And when I compose all these, I get a compound parent component, which still targets that proxy world so I can keep going, linking more and more. And so you can see this kind of works like a traditional middleware, except we're just using direct component linking. 
And then control flow is just synchronous call stack. You know, if I call through all four components to get to the HTTP API I'm proxying, it kind of looks like this. Or maybe I hit the rate limiter, or maybe I get a cache hit, or maybe authentication fails. And in addition to this sort of like linear control flow, we can express more complex control flow. Say I could have a component that does path-based routing, and it imports three handlers, and then I can snap on these individual proxy components on all the sides of it. And when I compose that, I get a compound component that still targets this proxy world, so I can run this compound component anywhere I can run a proxy component, which is pretty cool. And maybe the control flow based on the path goes this way through the rate limiter, or maybe a different path gets a, goes to the caching, and maybe another path kind of passes through. And this is kind of starts to look like microservice chaining, or what you can express with microservices, except there's no network stack here. It's just fast function calls. But there's just one little problem with this whole beautiful Lego blocky design, which is concurrency. <laughs> because alas, simple HTTP is, is not very concurrent. Um, compared to say, any sort of modern HTTP server. And kind of going down the checklist of what we might want, we would want concurrent outgoing requests, where while I'm making one outgoing request and waiting for a response, I can issue another one that runs at the same time. We want concurrent incoming requests, so while I'm handling one incoming request and making those outgoing requests, I can concurrently handle another incoming request in the same components, which can have its own outgoing requests. And then lastly, we want streaming bodies of these requests and responses so that as different chunks of data arrive, I get them as they come in. And we need to be able to do all this, so instead of this simple HTTP, in WASI 0.2, WASI HTTP is defined like this. The proxy world imports an outgoing handler and exports an incoming handler, which are different interfaces. The outgoing handler will take an outgoing request and return an incoming response. And incoming handler is similar, but similar with just reverse directions. And then instead of two request uh, and response resources, we now have four crossing request and response with incoming and outgoing. And all four of them have a body method that would return an input and output stream. And we factor out these input and output stream resource types into WASI I.O. so they can be shared with all the proposals that want to do streaming of bytes, like WASI file system. And the pattern here is that when I do a read or writes, and it's not ready, either because the, there's back pressure on the writes or the, there's no bytes available for the read, then they return a sentinel value, like zero or the empty list. When that happens, I need to call the subscribe method, which returns a pullable. And then when I have all the pullables for all the things that I want to wait on, I can call this synchronous blocking pull function, passing all the pullables that I'm waiting on, and it'll block until one of them's ready, and, or one or more of them are ready, and then it'll return which ones are ready, and then I can call their read and write and make progress. So you can see this is significantly more complex than that simple HTTP, but achieves a lot of the concurrency you want, so you know, that's you know, what we did in 0.2. It's great. But it does leave some room for improvement in WASI 0.3. So first, if you're familiar with select, uh, you'll have noticed poll is on, and so that means it'll have the same scalability problems if you have a lot of pullables. And this is an easy enough to fix thing. We just need to add some sort of epoll-like resource to WASI I.O. More significantly, though, the generated bindings for 0.2 end up just being too raw, verbose, and low level. Because no one wants to manage like a bunch of pullables. You want to use our native language native concurrency features like, you know, a sync await, promises, futures, go routines, go routines, actors. And lastly, uh, we've lost that kind of nice Lego block composability that I, we saw with uh, sim simple HTTP. Because simply because the interfaces are just different and they're not like trivially adaptable. So what happens in, in, uh, in practice, if folks want to do this, and folks are doing this, is you have to do some sort of like host-specific middleware service chaining framework that you use to link the components together in some other way. So how do we actually improve this and do some of these things or fix some of these? Well, first, let me take a step back, and let's walk through how a cross-component call works in 0.2 today. So let's say I'm defining a component that exports a transform function. And this is something I could implement in just a few lines of JavaScript using jQuery Componentize today. It's all like uppercase a string. So Componentize will spit out a component containing a core module. That core module will export a core function that takes that string as a pointer length pair, which are pointers into the linear memory of WASM, because that's how WASM takes all compound values. So that raises the question, how specifically do we go from this high-level string type and the low-level low level layout of you know, bits in memory and I32 pointers? And to answer this, the component model provides a, what's called a lifting definition, which lifts a core function into a component level function. And in this lifting definition, we get to specify a bunch of different options, like which memory to use, because there can be multiple. 
which allocation function to use, that's somewhere in the core module, and what string encoding to use. And the point is, I can have another component that imports this transform function, and it has its own core module and its own linear memory, and it can lower this imported transform function, which is kind of the opposite of lift, lowering a component level function into a core function, and getting to specify the same sort of options, like this memory, this allocation function, and maybe I want to use UTF-16 in this component. And it's the component model's job to make this call kind of just work. So how does it just work? So let's say control flow enters the caller's core WASM function somehow, and the caller writes their UTF-16 arguments into memory that they want to pass to the callee. So the caller then calls the imported transform function, but we can't call the transform function of the callee directly, because first of all, it has literally a different signature, but also it's like relative to different memories, so the I32s are you know, offsets into different memories. So instead, the call goes into a cross-component adapter that's defined by the component model, which is generated at compile time by a ahead of time fusion of the lifting and lowering to do one kind of optimized fusion of them. And so this adapter starts by calling the allocation function of the callee to allocate a buffer and then do a fused copy and transcode of the UTF-16 into the UTF-8 arguments. And given this, the adapter now calls the transform function passing a pointer to this now UTF-8 argument. The transform function runs, produces the UTF-8 results, and returns a pointer to the adapter. The adapter now calls the allocation function of the caller, getting a buffer in the caller's memory, and now does a fused copy and transcode of UTF-8 back into UTF-16 and returns the resulting string to the caller, now in the expected memory and the expected encoding. And so what we can see is that the component model like, kind of cover, you know, uh, covers these differences in lifting and lowering options, and what's cool is we can spec more of these lifting and lowering options over time, as long as they compose with all the other lifting and lowering options, because the point is that these are an implementation detail. The only thing we see in the signature is the component type. We don't have to, shouldn't have to care about what the lifting and lowering option of the other side is doing. So for example, now that WASM GC is at stage four, it's just a matter of time until we add a GC option. Actually, there's a PR proposing this like in progress today. And this GC option would be able to say, instead of the linear memory and allocation function, uh, you can use WASM GC array types and then use the GC to allocate the memory. And the other side's still doing linear memory, and so the component model can make this just work and compose. So then back, getting back to our 0 0.3 question of what we can do to improve the concurrency situation, what if we added an async lift and lower option? Then async would not be part of the public interface, and instead each component could choose whether to do async as an implementation detail of that component, which is important because not all components can or should be async and we don't want to partition the ecosystem based on this syncness. We don't want to have to say what color is your components and by reference to uh, what color is your function blog post. Um, but the question we have to ask is, you know, would it compose? And historically, this has uh, been tricky to achieve, you know, getting sync and async to compose. But by the power of components, particularly their uh, shared nothingness, uh, I think, yeah, I think perhaps you can. So let's, let's see how. But first, a disclaimer. Uh, this is a sketch, not a complete design. The goal is to communicate early thinking, to solicit feedback. It may all be totally wrong. But with that disclaimer out of the way, let's start by seeing how a single async component could work. Say a component that imports a fetch function and uses that to implement an exported lookup function. So our control flow starts in the host event loop, calls into the lookup function, which we've lifted with this new async option. And so the core exported signature is totally different. The first weird thing we'll notice is that the parameters are empty. And instead, we have to imp import this imp uh, built-in called call.start, which returns our arguments. So what's the reason for all this runaround? Well, now that we're in the async world, it's possible to have too many active calls, which are each using up memory. And if another call happens, which allocates further into our address space, we can oom. Um. So we need to be able to exert back pressure. And back pressure we exert by waiting to delay the call of call.start until more pre uh, currently in progress calls finish. So this is like useful here in general, but also it's going to be super useful in just a little bit. So this back pressure will be come back. But no back pressure here, so we just start the call. That returns our arguments, and now we call fetch. Fetch can block, and we don't want to block the caller. But since we've lowered with this new async option, the imported core signature of fetch is different also. It takes the results as an out parameter that get filled in asynchronously and returns a status of this call, which can be that this call is not done. It's blocked. 
And then when that happens, we get back an index into an async call table of calls that are in progress, which is maintained by the component model. So now we have an async fetch in progress, and lookup gets to keep running. So it can do another fetch, and that can block, and that can turn that it's not done, and now we have two async fetches in progress. And now, to actually make some progress, or wait for one of these to finish, lookup can return to the host's event loop, saying that it's not done. And when it does this, it also gets to return a context parameter, which is just some arbitrary i32 that it makes up or gets to choose. And the idea is that this lifting definition also has a callback immediate, which is a second function that gets called back by the host when an event has happened, threading through this context that maintains the async call state. So let's say the time passes, the fetch finishes, and so the host calls our callback and says, hey, that call zero is done now. So we make some progress and then return back to the event loop saying, I need to wait for the second to finish. More time passes, the second fetch finishes, and the host calls us back again. It says, hey, your second call's done now. So now the async lookup function can compute its final results and pass it out with call.return, which is kind of the opposite of call.start. And now the whole async call is done. And the important thing is that all this low-level ABI stuff is not what I have to write. This is what the compiler does for me. What I want to write is ultimately some async JavaScript that exports an async function that calls await a fetch. And that can just work because we have these lifting and lowering definitions that connect the high-level type, which is what the bindings need to generate the idiomatic async functions, with the low-level concurrent ABI that the uh, runtime, the concurrency runtime of the language actually needs to integrate with. But we always have to ask, does it compose? So let's now consider two components in the case where they're both async. So this is a component, you know, we'll start with a component the same shape as the last one, and we'll link in another component that imports that lookup and exports a transform function. And it's all lifted and lowered with async. So control flow starts in the host event loop, calls into the transform function, which calls through an adapter into the lookup function. The lookup function calls fetch, it blocks, returns that it's not done, and now we have an async fetch in progress. Lookup wants to wait for that result, so it returns to the event loop, which is the adapter in this case. The adapter knows that the caller is also async, so it just takes that context, bottles it up into an async lookup function, and returns back to the transform, saying the call is not done. So now, transform can keep running, and it can do lots of stuff, including making another async call to lookup. And if that happens, the same sequence happens, and now we have two async fetches and lookups in progress. Transform can now return to the host event loop to wait, wait for uh, one of them to make progress. So time passes, a fetch finishes, and the host calls the callback of the first components to say, your fetch is done now. Callback one can now complete this async lookup call by producing a result and return back to the event loop. The host knows that component two is waiting on that lookup, so it calls callback two, saying, your first call to lookup finished, make progress. It needs to go back, it returns to the event loop to wait for the second one to finish. Time passes, the second fetch finishes, CB1's called again, saying, uh, your second fetch is done, it computes a result, completing the second lookup call, and then CB2 is called again, saying your second lookup call is done. It gets to compute its results, and that's the result of the whole async lookup call, or transform call, excuse me. And then the whole async call stack is done. So this is kind of noisy, but ultimately this is like normal low-level event loop concurrency, and the point is, you know, we're, we're not writing this manually, and we're, we're writing high-level languages, and we're doing this in a cross-language manner. So component one can be written in async JavaScript, and component two can be in async Rust, for example. All right, well, now let's switch to the case where the calling component is sync. Say it's some Python code that does a synchronous lookup call. And concretely, this is when the callee uses the async, but the caller component doesn't, and the default is synchronous. That's what we have in 0.2. So control flow starts in the host event loop, calls the synchronous transform function, which calls to the adapter into the async lookup function, Let's say it kicks off two concurrent fetches and now returns to the adapter. The adapter knows the caller is sync and waiting, so the adapter just spins the event loop in place and waits for a fetch to finish and then delivers all the results and keeps going until eventually the whole async lookup call is finished. And then the adapter returns the synchronous result to the transform function as expected, and the whole call completes. So this case kind of falls out as in the obvious way, and so we call it the easy case. Now, if we reverse the cases where the calling component is async and the callee is sync, this ends up being the hard case. So let's make some space and see how this case works out, because it's fun. So we start in the host event loop. We call into our async transform function, which calls through the adapter into the synchronous lookup function, which now synchronously calls fetch. Fetch can block. 
Now, we don't want to suspend or block the entire call stack because we need to get back somehow to this asynchronous transform function so it can make progress, because that's what it wants to do. So we use low-level VM trickery to suspend the, the synchronous callees stack up to the adapter. And this technique is variously called fibers or stackful coroutines or delimited continuations. But whatever you call it, the stack gets bottled up by the adapter and then returned as a normal async call to the async caller, who can keep running. So is that it? Is, you know, is jobs done? Well, not quite. We have to consider what happens if the async caller now tries to re-enter that synchronous and now suspended callee, which it can totally do. Like we saw that in the previous example. Async callers can re-enter and call any callee. So it's not wrong for Transform to want to do this, but we have to say, like, what actually happens? Because if we simply re-enter the components, like, it's suspended. It's doing like a synchronous read call, and we just suspended it. So if we just run arbitrary code, that's just like totally going to blow things up. It's going to like break all the assumptions. Nobody expects to be re-entered when they do some random you know, blocking synchronous syscall. So we can't do that. And we also can't uh, just trap, because it's nothing wrong for the caller to want to do this. So instead, to fix this hole in the plan, we apply our friendly, good old friend, back pressure. We can just say the adapter says, I see the call is suspended, so I'm just going to return that the call hasn't started, which is totally a thing that can happen with an async call. It's just like we're saying we apply back pressure as soon as we have more than one, we would have more than one call in progress. So now we have two async lookup calls going, and the transform function can keep running, and eventually it's done, and it, or it needs to wait for progress, so it turns to the host event loop. Let's see how this plays out. So time passes. The fetch call makes progress, so that fiber is resumed. Now the fetch can return its synchronous result or its result synchronously to the lookup function, which returns its results. The host knows that there is an enqueued or a waiting lookup function, so it immediately kicks that off. So now that second lookup call starts. It can call fetch, that can block, we suspend the fiber. And now the host can know that knows that the uh, second component was waiting for the first lookup call, and the first lookup call, lookup call is done. So the host calls CB2 and says, your first fetch is done. So that makes progress and goes back to wait to the event loop. Now the second fetch call finishes, which returns its result to lookup, which returns its results. And now CB2 is called again, and the transform function can return its final async results. So that kind of explains you know, how the hard case would work. And it you know, seems like it would compose and work. So that's awesome. And what I think is cool about this is that it uniquely leverages this power of components. And to kind of illustrate why, let's consider trying to apply the same technique without the benefit of components, where we just have a sea of functions, some async and sync. So control flow enters the async functions. They call into the sync functions. They block. We suspend them. And so if we call those functions again, yeah, they should exert back pressure. But what about all the other functions? What, can I call any of them? Well, let's say that in the middle of being suspended, these synchronous functions were modifying some state. That state could be in sort of a corrupted, sort of intermediate state. So we need to consider that state suspended. And therefore, any function that accesses that suspended state should also be considered function uh, suspended transitively. But if we have some state over here that was not being modified, it's fine. So any functions that only access that state are fine, and transitively access them are fine. So we have some functions that are fine to call, but others that aren't. So how do we actually partition state and code like this uh, practically and concretely, because we have to be very precise about this. Well, this is hard to do in most languages using normal language features. Like, probably Haskell can do a thing with monads, but I think all other languages are going to have trouble. But by the power of components, we basically got it for free because components naturally partition code and state. So, you know, shared nothing for the win. So then, going back to our question of would async as a lifting and lowering option compose? You know, we enumerated the four cases, and they all seem to do a sensible thing. So it seems like, yes, they could. And then applying that back to the WASI HTTP question, in 0.3, then, our proxy world can import and export the same handler interface, which, could look this, uh, which means we can compose proxy components again like we were in the simple HTTP. They can just snap together, so that's great. And our handler interface can basically look the same as it did in simple HTTP handler, because now, when we go down our concurrency checklist, we can get concurrent outgoing requests by lower async, and we can get concurrent incoming requests if we lift async. And that just leaves the question of how to do the streaming bodies of requests and responses. And to do that, we need to add a stream type. 
And with that stream type, we can tweak our original simple HTTP request to instead of taking a list of U8s as his body, to take a stream of U8 as the body, and similarly, the body method to return a stream of U8. And the stream is part of the WIT interface, unlike async, which is an implementation detail. And that's because all code needs to care about streams, if for no other reason than to avoid OOM, because streams are meant for cases where you have large, very, potentially very large amounts of bytes that don't all fit into memory. So then just to kind of give a sample of how streaming can actually work in practice, say we have a component that exports a transform function from you know, bytes to bytes, from stream of bytes to stream of bytes, I mean. The core export looks the same as before, so this is the not difference. And our control flow starts in the host event loop, which calls into the transform function, and now it starts the call. Based on the parameter type, the return value of call.start is an index into a readable streams table maintained by the component model that holds this stream of bytes that's coming in. So start, call.start returns the index, index of that stream, which is zero. Now we want to create our return value, so we call stream.new, which returns two indices, the readable and writable end of the same new stream. So streams have two ends, a readable and writable end, and now we have handles to both of them, but it's the same stream. So we have those two indices. Now we do call.return to return the readable ends of this new stream we just created, which transfers ownership of it to the calling component or the host, because these readable and writable ends are uniquely owned by only one component. So now we have the readable end of our parameter and the writable ends of our return value, which is what we want. So now we can actually like, do some streaming. So we allocate a buffer in our, in our memory, and we call stream.read, passing the pointer to that buffer and saying which stream we want to read from, which installs a pointer from the readable stream to our buffer. Now, if bytes are already available, they can be immediately copied in, but in general, we'll have to wait. So stream.read returns that it's not done. And then to wait for that, transform returns to the host event loop saying it's not done. Time passes, bytes get written into the buffer that came from wherever, and now our callback gets called, saying, you read, let's say, two bytes at the readable stream at index zero, and oh, by the way, the stream is closed now, so that's all the bytes you're all ever gonna get from the stream. So we now have our inputs. And we wanna write our output, so we transform it to an output buffer, say we capitalize it. Now we call stream.write. Stream.write uh, now points to, or the writable stream now points to our output buffer, and then this is a chance for there to be back pressure. If we're writing too much and we need to slow down, the stream.write can return that it's not done. And then we have to return to the event loop to wait for the write to complete, and then our callback gets called again saying, hey, we wrote two bytes. And if that's all we wanted to write, we can now close the stream, removing it from our writable streams table, and now the whole async call can be done. So one thing we can notice from this is this is more of a completion-based uh, ABI, kind of like IOU ring. And in fact, IOU ring would be uh, able to do a really good job optimizing this when we're doing host streaming. And the other thing is that this is designed for language integration. So what I actually get to write in my source code would be, say, in JavaScript, an async transform function that takes a readable stream, and you know, given a readable stream, I can, say, pipe it through a decompression stream and get a readable stream that I return, and that should just work. And it's the job of the compiler and VM to integrate with all these low-level ABI, as enabled by the lifting and lowering definition that connects the high-level stream type to the low-level concurrency ABI. And there's a whole bunch more to say about this than time allows, because one does not simply async. But briefly, we'll also likely need a future type, which will be rare since we can lower async any import, so effectively any function may can have a future return type if you want it. Uh, but occasionally it's still useful for advanced concurrency scenarios. We would need uh, probably a non-blocking attribute to say this function will never transitively make a blocking call, so don't even bother with lower async or async bindings for this function. A cancellation to say, I don't care about the results anymore, please wrap it up. But cooperatively, not brutally, like pthread kill. Flushing to say, nothing is coming for a while. So flush all the buffers. Splicing to efficiently zero copy from readable to writable streams. And to allow us to tear down WASM instances once all that's left is host to host splices. And structure concurrency to provide cross component call stacks and also get open telemetry spans for free which we can enforce via trapping rules just by saying that import calls are not allowed to outlive their parent export calls. So where are threads in all this, you might be asking? Well, threads, importantly, are an orthogonal feature. So you could be async without multi-threading, and you can do multi-threading without being async. So how do you multi-thread? Well, that's a whole separate topic, but there is a thread.new built-in proposed in the component model that you can see right now in the component model explainer. <clears throat> 
And it is layered on top of a new core WebAssembly proposal that's receiving a lot of active work by the browsers right now called Shared Everything Threads, which introduces a shared attribute that's critically used by thread.new. And can I use both together? Well, yes, in theory, the feature should compose, but we're still figuring out those details, so I won't attempt to sketch them here. So as next steps, well, good news is that experimental work is well underway, and you know, all credit going to Joel Dice at Fermion for doing this. He's got a project called ISIS WASPA, which stands for I Sync, You Sync, We All Sync for Async, which is really cool, <laughs> worth checking out just for the name. It's an experimental polyfill of 0.3 features on top of 0.2 runtimes, exploring guest bindings in the full async developer experience. And it's using a draft of WASI HTTP that's currently also in the WASI HTTP proposal and it being implemented by this ISIS WASPA. So you can check out what this WASI uh, HTTP could actually look like with these features. You know, I'll be working on component model spec PRs to hash out the precise details and get like full review of the details. And, and again, all of this will happen in parallel with the incremental WASI 0.2 releases that I talked about at the beginning. So in conclusion, components in 0.2 give us fabulous secret powers. But once we do serious concurrency, we start to lose a few of them. With 0.3, we want to fix that by adding a new stream and future types for use in function types and a new async ABI option that applies to all function types. And for this, the shared nothing design of components is crucial, allowing synchronous and asynchronous components to compose by circumscribing suspended synchronous state and code. And if this is exciting to you, if you want to get involved with WASI or components or async specifically, check out the component model spec repo. Uh, there's a, you can attend WASI subgroup meetings, attend component model implementation meetings hosted by the Bytecode Alliance, and talk to Bytecode Alliance folks in the Zulip chat. And that's it. Thanks a lot. That was a great talk. Uh, I'm curious about the lifting and lowering functions. Um, I'm worried that on a hot path, potentially, it might be slow to be continuously lifting and lowering uh, data between two uh, components. Is there a way to uh, uh, get around that, uh, potentially for um, components that are written in the same language or maybe otherwise? Yeah, there's, there's a whole space of options. One thing when you're using different blobs of code written in the same language is you can link them into the same component, either statically or as dynamic core modules that are linked inside of a single component, and therefore they can share the same memory. So in the limit, you can do that. And when you're using like lots of packages from the same like, you know, language registry, like a bunch of crates, that is by default what will happen. So same language tends to go into the same component. Um, when, we're in, when we want actually two different components, you know, streams can help you know, really optimize the transfer data, especially with small chunks. You get a bunch of like temporal locality, so cache hits, so that helps things. If you have large amounts of bytes, resources are a thing. You put the bytes in the resource and transfer a handle to the resource. So you're not actually copying all the bytes. You're just passing around handles to the resource. Um, and yeah, there's a, and lastly, inlining is a thing. We have a lot of AOT knowledge of, of what's linking to what. So ahead of time, we can do inlining, which can also reduce the cost of the lifting and lowering. So these are all things that can. Cool. Be. Thank you so much. I, uh, you, you didn't mention anything about like foreign functions and um, the complexities that they may introduce with like maybe reentrancy or um, with you know it, it bringing in effectively the world a shared state. Um, is that is that because there's they, they don't introduce complexity or we just don't want to get into that? Uh, what do you mean by by foreign functions? I guess uh, sorry, like imported functions from host-defined functions. Okay. Um, Sorry, I, I kind of missed uh, the question. So the, the, the question is, um, the imported like host-defined functions can you know, have their own state effectively, effectively the whole world. Um, you, were, you were talking about like in, with back pressure, you were, you were depending on the fact that you can uh, you know, analyze these data dependencies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you also didn't have uh, like the ability to like re-enter 
um, as you would with, with host-defined functions. Um, so like, are, are there complexities there that we just didn't cover that, you know, that, for, that host-defined functions introduce, or, or um, are, are those just treated the same as every oh, other? Oh, yeah, function? yeah, I guess, yeah, they're supposed to work the same way. The, like, one of the high-level goals of the component model is this kind of virtualization principle, which is any WIT interface should be implementable either by the host or a component, and you kind of don't know as the other side of the interface which you're getting. And this preserves the ability when I have a given component that I want to run, I can either run a component that natively implements its imports, or if I have different imports, you know, maybe lower level ones or just something else, I can have another component adapting from what I do have into what the component I want to run is importing. So this virtualizability principle is pretty important, and it ends up meaning that host functions don't act differently than what would happen with, when the other side is another component. Thank you. So, oh, I, I go first. <laughs> uh, thanks for the talk, amazing. Uh, but you said that the components should share nothing, but you can actually share memory, for example, or share other fun things like host function with a state and whatever. Uh, how are you considering to, to solve this problem? Within a single component, you can share a lot of memory by importing or nesting different core modules, and then inside the component, you can see how they all link together. So that's one form of sharing that is allowed. Um, and then I guess another thing is if I have a component that I import and multiple components import the same mutual shared instance of a component, it can have state, and they can kind of communicate through that but it's going through an interface. In some sense, that's unavoidable. Like, as soon as <laughs> you can talk to the outside world and have I.O., you can indirectly have shared state. So this fact that you can have this kind of high-level shared state is why sometimes we don't say shared nothing, right? Because we're like, well, you do sort of share state, like in this indirect way. So shared nothing really means we're not sharing the low-level byte array or like the low-level memory, which we go through this interface. And so there's at least you know, a separation between this like kind of more explicit sharing, which now you can see in the linkage graph of, oh, these two components import the same mutual, you know, shared store of some sort, as opposed to everything shared by default, we're all sharing in living one big byte array. You know, that's, so it's, it's sort of a uh, difference in kind, even though technically, yes, there's always some, probably some shared state unless you're like a pure function. Are you going to, to specify those kind of sharing? So, um, well, I, are we going to specify the? Yes, define formally. I mean, uh, what a module can export or import, or what can share with other modules. Or yeah, I, I guess you'd say the components declare very explicitly as part of the binary, as part of their declared interface. These are my imports, and then when you instantiate that components, either as the host or some parent component, you choose how those imports get satisfied. So you know what they're connected to. There's not this ambient global state that everybody kind of gets to pull from. So that's. I guess a, a, a part I didn't get to go into that's more of in the other component model talk, but it's imports are parameters. When you instantiate a component, you are providing arguments to those parameters. There's no ambient global shared namespace of all the data stores and stuff. So yeah, there's a, that's a whole talk to go into separately, I guess. OK, thanks. Yeah. I love this idea that I don't know if they have colors of components. It's funny, as I work with Bob, so he'll be very happy that you mentioned the color of components. Um, I love the idea that you can you know, mix async and sync and magic will happen. I'm wondering, just to make sure I understand though, will I, if I'm defining a component, will I always define every function as sync or do I hint that it, it, it works well asynchronously? Like, how does that work? Yeah, well, the, the signature kind of doesn't say it. It's sort of like a quality of implementation of how concurrent is this component which is kind of the case in any ways. How, when you implement even an async thing, you can take lots of locks and actually in practice not be very component, or you can do a lot of optimizations and actually be very component. So you could think of a sync component that lifts everything sync as just being very low concurrency. As a caller of a component, yeah, you can, yeah. Uh, I guess there's a whole separate topic of what if I would like to run a bunch of, compo uh, a, I have a, there's a synchronous component and I want to do a bunch of s concurrent jobs. Uh, I can make lots of instances of this child components, and each one can do a different synchronous blocking call, but I'm making multiple instances, so they're separately suspended. So there's a whole direction of ways that you can kind of get around synchronicity if you want to reuse a component that's not very concurrent, but you would like more concurrency. So is the takeaway there that if I'm authoring a component 
I'm imagining the .NET days where I'm clear in the function definition, this function's safe to call concurrently or not, or mm -hmm. safe to call multi-thread or not. Mm -hmm. So in the short term, it's gonna be documentation. Like I'm gonna be very clear if I define a component, how I want to be called, if I'm thread safe or allow multiple in invocations. Well, the cool thing about this design is you kind of don't need that, right? Because when I call a function, I know for sure if, I'm call if I lower it async, it's not gonna block me. If it tries to block, I'm gonna get control flow. So the worst that call can do is itself be blocked, but I don't get blocked. I get to keep running. I get to do other async work. Now, if all my calls are to the same component and it's blocked, and yeah, they'll, they'll serialize, but I, in some sense, there was no way around that one. But that's not the same problem as in, say, like, you know, .NET or Rust, like where if an async function calls a synchronous function that blocks, you're just blocked. Like, you're, you're stuck on the call stack. So it, that's the kind of trick we can do with the component boundary with the, implicit, the suspend and back pressure thing. I guess I should probably stop now. But happy to talk more about this with everyone over the next uh, year. All right. <laughs> See you.